So today we have a second lecture from Professor William Scott from Indiana University, Purdue University in Indianapolis on combinatorial chemistry. Uh, and since we had introduction uh, the previous time, so I suggest it. William, please come on with your lecture. Good. <clears throat> Thank you once again, uh, Professor Grigorenko, for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, it's especially a privilege when I'm aware of all the expertise in Kiev uh, and doing things at Enamine Chem Space, constructing these virtual libraries of compounds, and making them available to people throughout the world and compounds that can be uh, synthesized based on the, the good expertise at those institutions. So uh, I regard it as an honor to be able to be here and, and talk to people who might, some of them might be at Enamine or Chem Space. So I'm going to talk today about uh, combinatorial chemistry and solid phase synthesis. Um, enamine might use principally the solution phase synthesis, but I'm going to focus on how combinatorial chemistry is uh, made available through solid phase synthesis. So I'm going to begin by really what was one of my inspirations for getting involved in combinatorial chemistry a long time ago. And that was I was involved in an immunological program and I was aware of how uh, biology and antibodies work. And it's just an incredibly powerful and impressive process. So let me just go through that briefly to show you how the nature solves problems using combinatorial, I'll call it biochemistry. So as an example, a very current example would be survival of people who have been infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, the solution for our body is to use the immune system, which has available just millions of B cell populations, each of which can make a different antibody and have those antibodies, which uh, can be uh, 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 examined by the spike protein or, or, or targeted by the spike, spike protein. Um, and a B cell population is identified that produces particular antibodies that will bind tightly to that spike protein that will result in the production of lots and lots of that particular antibody. And uh, with good luck, we will now recover from SARS-CoV-2. There's another side to that uh, uh, problem solving process. And that is uh, common again in nature, we have resistance to whatever drugs we might uh, come up with. In the case of the body, we come up with the antibodies and the uh, uh, virus gets around our antibodies in a similar combinatorial process. So, I'll look at the, this is a challenge for the virus now. How are you going to resist um, the, the uh, attack by antibodies that have been produced by these B cells? So the virus does a similar combinatorial process. It has uh, spontaneous mutations in the spike protein uh, that was going to be recognized by the antibody and identifies variants of those spike proteins that now evade the antibodies that were had previously been selected by our B, from our B cell populations. And now those antibodies no longer work. The best mutant for the uh, a virus survives. And now we have uh, another problem. We need more vaccinations, or if you haven't been vaccinated, you're vulnerable again to the virus. So this is a great example of problem solving where there are many uh, numbers of potential solutions explored there's a selection process to identify the best solution. And the problem is either solved or in the case of, of the uh, virus, the problem is created because of the virus uh, developing resistance through its own mutation process. So let's look at the antibody process just a little bit closer to see how powerful it is in relation to the combinatorial process. Uh, if you look at what's happening with antibodies, we have a, a combinatorial library, millions of protein, molecular probes, which are the antibodies, in fact, that are biosynthesized by the B cell from a simple basis set of 20 amino acids. So this is a, a great illustration of the huge numbers of compounds you can make from a very limited set of starting materials if you've got a really powerful synthetic pathway in place. In this case, it's a biological synthetic pathway. Then once the uh, body and these B cells have synthesized this large collection of antibodies, it has a quick and effective way to test and see which of those antibodies is going to best bind to the foreign substance, which we call an antigen. 
And then the body rapidly scales up the production of that particular antibody. So let's look at it schematically. When you look at the, how uh, uh, B cells develop, they come from a, a stem cell. And in the DNA in the stem cell is rearranged in many different uh, possible rearrangement patterns, which in turn code for the protein, the antibody proteins that are going to be produced by specific B cells. So this B cell one has specific DNA rearrangement that codes for a very specific antibody. Likewise, uh, B3 would be coded differently, different DNA sequence codes for a different antibody. And all these B cells, there are you know, millions of them, have coding their surface identical antibodies, but those identical antibodies are different from the antibodies on the adjacent B cell based on that combinatorial process of DNA rearrangement. So if we look at uh, an individual B cell, we'll call it B7, it's got stuck to the surface. These antibodies all have the same structure, but they're all different from another B cell, B6. And they're just waiting to see if there's some kind of antigen, uh, a foreign substance that has uh, entered the body. And they're if they do by chance bind to that, that B cell is told to clone itself, expand the population, and now produce a lot of that antibody. And hopefully you will be cured. Looking at a, a little bit more detail of this from the lock and key point of view that I, I, I discussed in the, in the previous uh, uh, lecture on drug discovery, we can look at the antigen as being in, a, in effect a lock that has to be uh, fit by a, key, a particular key. And so here we have an antigen, it could be the spike protein, the surface of the spike protein, and the antibody, a huge molecule, 150,000 uh, Daltons, has in one area what's called a hypervariable region. And this is a, where a lot of changes based on that DNA rearrangement in the B cells produce all sorts of different uh, protein structures in that hypervariable region, which are gonna be the key that uh, bind, potentially binds to that antigen. So imagine again, you've got millions of these different antibodies and you've got millions of different shapes uh, uh, constructed by that DNA rearrangement and the corresponding expression of those proteins. So Let's look at it again very schematically, but look at a, a, lot, a tiny region of what's known as the hypervariable region in the antibody. That's where all the changes are, are happening. In that region, you've got, uh, I'll just show schematically, a three amino acid sequence with uh, side chains R1, R2, and R3. And these are being uh, swapped out in all the different antibodies on the surfaces of all these uh, B cells in different patterns. And so what happens is the body has all these different variables avail available to it. And it just so happens that there might be a sequence, in this case, uh, glutamine, alanine, and lysine with side chains that happen to have the right three-dimensional conformation and, and uh, uh, chemical binding characteristics that one will fit into the uh, hypothetical hydrogen bonding pocket here, another a hydrophobic pocket, another carbon, a cation uh, binding pocket. And these become the, just the key to recognize that lock, that antigen binding surface. So that's how uh, our immune system works quite effectively. Combinatorial chemists, uh, some may have been aware of this, I think is a great analogy of the immune system, but even if they weren't, they were aware of the possibility of making large libraries of molecules uh, in the early days. And the concept was let's make a whole bunch of these um, diverse molecules establish a quick and effective testing system to identify which of those might be in effect the, the key to fit to a particular disease target, and then uh, generate a further diversity of those molecules through rapid analog synthesis. Again, the, the potential was make large numbers of possible molecular solutions, have a good selection process to figure which ones work, and that would be the problem solved. Now that was the, uh, the uh, vision. Uh, in a very uh, kind of cynical way, the economist uh, had a, a, a drawing of combinatorial chemists in action way back in the early 19s, 1990s, where they envisioned rather than the expert medicinal chemist constructing a few molecules and shooting them at the target, they had this big shotgun approach and just fired everything but the kitchen sink at the target, found the one that stuck, and, and that became the drug. That is probably a good uh, and uh, a lead-in to 
the problems that we have with combinatorial chemistry. In the early days, this perhaps was a good uh, uh, picture of what was going on. Namely, we figured out what, what, what could we do chemically, whatever we could do chemically, we use that to construct libraries without a lot of thought going in to figuring out what particular molecules should be part of that shotgun thrown at the, the target. So there was a lot of uh, uh, misses, we'll say. So since then, the combinatorial uh, driven drug discovery process has evolved. Obviously we have to have a molecular target, but this is what I think I'm gonna focus on a lot today is that when we make these multiple molecular probes to hit the molecular target, we're gonna to wanna to have diverse sets of probes available for potential construction to hit that target. And a concept which again, uh, enamine chemspace know quite well, is that uh, we, it would be valuable to construct a virtual library of the possible probes that you can make based on the chemistry that's available. And before you even make them, do some computational analysis of that virtual library so we can narrow that shotgun uh, of probes to something that makes a little bit more sense based on our all, already understanding of medicinal chemistry. Then of course we need equipment to carry out the reactions and a high throughput purification and analysis process. We've got to figure out which of those molecules were uh, the hits and so something I won't discuss at all is the uh, final side of this process, which is you got to screen these molecules. So you have to have a really good relevant screen to tell what uh, molecules hit the target and figure out exactly what it was. Uh, so that sometimes is a problem. And then of course, you got to keep track of all this stuff. If you're going to make a lot of molecules, both uh, uh, computationally, you got to keep track of them, but physically you got to keep track of them too. So it becomes a big, big challenge. So I'm going to start out by talking about some of the synthetic procedures that are used and, and methodologies to, to make these large uh, libraries of compounds combinatorially. Uh, the first is parallel synthesis, and this isn't combinatorial yet. It's where you just conduct a lot of simultaneous reactions, uh, you know, side by side, but you only have one site of substitution. That'll be parallel synthesis, and I'll show you an example of that momentarily. And then there's combinatorial synthesis, which will have two or more sites of substitution. It allows you to have like the antibody process, two amino acids, at, uh, I mean, amino acids at two different positions, 20 times 20. If you have 20 amino acids, you've got 400 just combination there. So you have two or more sites of substitution in the molecule uh, target. So here's an example of uh, a solid phase parallel synthesis. In the first step, people will, uh, and I'll use as an illustration here, making a dipeptide. And the dipeptide we're going to make here is every single uh, molecule from this, this parallel synthesis is going to have an alanine residue at the right-hand side, the carboxyl uh, terminus of this dipeptide. And we're going to vary R2. So the first step is to stick on that constant, the alanine, onto the resin B. Once that's there, then we begin the parallel synthesis. We distribute that across a row of uh, reaction vessels and do the second step where we're putting on a variable R2, which could be any one of many different amino acids. So here's, this is how it would look. You've, you've made that big batch of the resin bound alanine. You've now put it in tubes or whatever reaction vessels are gonna be appropriate for in this case, solid phase synthesis. But they're all, every uh, reaction vessel has exactly that same starting material with the alanine on it. The, the, parallel nature of that comes when you now do the second step and you introduce one of, in this case, 12 different uh, starting materials, uh, different amino acids with a different R2 group on that position to that constant alanine across. So remember there's alanine in all these reaction vessels. You now come down these uh, columns and introduce alanine as the second reagent uh, to make this dipeptide in the first column all the way to arginine in this case in the 12th column. And if you look at any uh, uh, particular example, you'll see that if you put serine in as this R2 residue here in the eighth column, the molecule that's generated in that vessel is the resin bound serine alanine, which is this product here, but we'll show it specifically in that vessel, only one molecule is made. Again, it has the alanine constant but uh, 
uh, that's a representation of the parallel synthesis. Let's talk about uh, combinatorial solid phase synthesis. We can use this very same example here where instead of starting out with just alanine and one uh, side chain on this uh, 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 protected amino acid, we, uh, we uh, connect to resin beads uh, eight different uh, amino acids. So we have eight different batches of uh, resin bound uh, amino acids from one to eight. That now can be distributed not just across the row. So we could have done the parallel synthesis where it had alanine as that residue all the way across row A, but we could have eight different amino acids resin bound, and we made a big batch of each one of those and distributed equally the same amino acid in row B, all across row B, a different amino acid, but all across row C, et cetera. That's the first step. If you now come back and in the second step, you have available 12 amino acids that are R2 that could be coupled to the eight amino acids that were our R1 to make the resin bound dipeptide, it begins to look like this. So I'm not showing all the, all the resins and all these vessels, but if you look at one particular row here as an example, row F, we had put across that all lysine bound to the uh, R1 uh, compound three here across that row. And then when we came in the combinatorial step, we came down column eight with serine. So every molecule, molecule reagent added to row, uh, I'm sorry, to column eight was serine. And so serine's coming down here, but if you look at the intersection now, you have a unique, out of all those 96 possible compounds, a unique dipeptide resin bound with serine now at this uh, left-hand side and with lysine at the right-hand side. And so each well will contain this unique combination. And again, if we focus on this one combination here, we see out of the 96 compounds, we have a unique dipeptide where serine is on the N-terminus uh, and on the right-hand side on the carboxyl terminus uh, is the lysine residue. So that's combinatorial chemistry in action. Again, we're not like quite at the scale of uh, antibody production in terms of millions from 20 amino acids, but here recognize you only have 12 starting materials because you use the same starting materials for the first step is for the second step. And so from just 12 starting materials, you could get 96 compounds. That begins to give you a, an indication of the power of, of CombiChem with a good procedure and a limited set of starting materials. Well, um, it's time to talk a little bit about solid phase chemistry and where that came from. Again, the peptide chemists were the, the pioneers in this area and, and uh, Merrifield at Rockefeller University was was really the pioneer in this area. What he recognizes, if you could attach uh, the starting materials, the first amino acid in a peptide synthesis to a polystyrene bead, you could greatly simplify all the steps in the synthesis. So what do these polystyrene beads, that's the most common uh, bead, but there are a lot of other resin beads for solid phase synthesis besides polystyrene, but I'm gonna just focus on this one resin because it's probably one of the most universally used resins uh, even today. Uh, polystyrene beads, they, they look like this, but remember, they're very porous. So uh, reagents get in through the little pores in these beads, greatly magnified here. And so a lot of, well, all the reactions basically are taking place in, inside this bead because it's much of the volume is inside the bead. Uh, there will be things on the surface too, but so solvents need to penetrate into these beads, bring in the reagents, uh, react with uh, whatever, uh, um, molecule you're building on uh, off of these beads. It's a, these are in the case of polystyrene, they're hydrophobic resins. Uh, hydrophobic resins, as you can imagine, because polystyrene's uh, pretty hydrophobic. Um, and uh, there are various loadings that you can get. There are various linkers to bind molecules to these beads. Uh, and um, most of it, uh, there, there's a I know I'm I'm guessing maybe eighty percent of of organic chemistry on solid phases carried out on polystyrene. Uh, because it's hydrophobic, you sometimes want different kinds of resins that are less hydrophobic for doing chemistry that involves molecules that are more uh, hydrophilic. So let's look at how uh, that uh, resin is actually constructed. Very, very simple. 
all Merrifield did was take styrene as a monomer, uh, spike it with a little bit of divinyl styrene. That had two vinyl groups instead of one, and that's going to cross-link as this con uh, polymer is constructed. So styrene is polymerized. It forms a, this long chain of polystyrene. Uh, but occasionally, throughout that long chain, there's one of these divinyl bi uh, benzenes that intercepted the growing chain and forms a cross-link to another chain over here. And it's by virtue of that, that this is rendered insoluble. And so it's not gonna dissolve in organic solvents. If it had just been polystyrene here without a cross-link, it'd be like your styrofoam cups where you squ squirt a little bit of acetone on them and immediately the, the styrofoam cup starts dissolving. Well, that wouldn't work if we're gonna do organic chemistry on styrene. So that's why it's, it's polymerized in the formation of these beads with the cross-link to guarantee it. So again, this is, you know, benzene rings are pretty unreactive. What uh, Merrifield did was he did a friedel crafts alkylation reaction to introduce a chloromethyl group onto uh, occasional uh, benzene rings uh, protruding from the polymer of polystyrene. That became the site at which you can now begin your solid phase chemistry by linking molecules to the polystyrene beads by displacement of the chlorine. So this just shows you a, a few examples of that. Here's an attachment where you have a molecule of the free carboxylic acid. The anion is generated, displaces the chlorine to form a simple ester link. That was the beginning of uh, the peptide chemistry and, and the, the, the uh, evolution from Merrifield's resin with the chloromethylated uh, polystyrene. These uh, links can be cleaved with hi uh, hydrofluorous acid or hydroxide. Now, um, in peptide chemistry, you worry about treating something with hydroxide and destroying the peptide chain. So HF is used, but it's kind of a noxious reagent. And it's something that we, we don't want to really have, have to often use in organic chemistry. So we've evolved away from this kind of link to other links that permit us to cleave the link between the, the, the now not just peptides, but organic molecules and polystyrene. This gives you one, just one example of a link that allows us to do this cleavage process a little bit uh, less intensively. Uh, we don't need the HF to do the cleavage. So uh, people stuck on to the polystyrene uh, that have been chloromethylated, they stuck on this, what we call linker. And because it's got an oxygen para to this group over here, if, when, once you attach the carboxylic acid to the polystyrene resin, it's a lot easier to cleave this bond with just acid because when you cleave it, you generate a cation here that's stabilized by that oxygen. So that's just one of the approaches people use. They develop all these different linkers to permit us to, to link and then cleave molecules from the resin when we want them under a simple conditions, hopefully not very harsh conditions. Uh, in this case, now because uh, this is acid labile, that linker will be cleaved by acid. You have to use chemistry uh, the peptide chemistry is chemistry that's all uh, under basic conditions. So they use a different protecting group, an FMOC protecting group that comes off with uh, basic, uh, uh, with the preparity and other base reagents. And then at the very end, they cleave with either trifluoroacetic acetic acid, or it, for in our cases, we can cleave with alkoxides or with uh, amine residues to get the final products cleave from the resin. So why would we want to use solid phase chemistry in purification or synthesis? First of all, and probably almost most important, is the simplification of the whole, whole procedure. The filtrations, uh, instead of having to do um, you know, chromatography, recrystallization, uh, distillation, um, traditional um, organic chemistry and solution uh, procedures to purify your material, if you've got pretty clean conversion on the resin, all you have to do is filter the beads, rinse away all the starting materials, rinse away all the byproducts that are in solution, and you have your resin beads with the molecule that's now been transformed into new molecule waiting for the next step. Um, to make sure these reactions go well, you have the luxury of using an excess of reagent that you might not want to do in solution because you have to get rid of that excess reagent and solution, but if it's simple enough to just uh, uh, filter the material, 
yeah, go ahead and use reagent excess and drive the, the reaction on the bead to completion. You can use difficult solvents that, again, would be kind of a mess in, in solution phase synthesis because they're difficult to separate from the, the product. Uh, example in our work would be n methyl pyrrolidinone. Automation. So when you get these procedures really worked out well, you can program sometimes uh, a, a, an apparatus to do the sequential steps uh, very simply. Uh, we can do these on a tiny scale. And, and next uh, week, I'll tell you about how our students use solid phase combinatorial chemistry, and they work on a 50 micromole scale. That's the equivalent to about 15 milligrams of starting material. They do a multi-step synthesis, and students who have never done chemistry before get good products at the end, good new molecules at the end. Uh, what kind of reaction vessels do we use? This is a really simple reaction vessel. All of the reaction vessels pretty much have the same uh, essential element, in, a frit of some sort that has the porosity, the uh, holes in it that are sufficiently small that polymer beads, these polystyrene beads can't go through that frit, but all the solvent and containing reagent starting materials and byproducts can go through it and you can purify it that way. This is a reaction vessel to do a large scale uh, reaction with polymer beads uh, that might be in for the peptide chemists, but it could be used by organic chemists too. Uh, in the days of CombiChem at Lilly, uh, we were pushing the limits in terms of uh, equipment to do small scale uh, reactions on uh, large numbers of, of reaction vessels. This isn't is an extreme, but it shows you something of where people were going. This was a piece of equipment that was uh, commercialized by uh, Robbins, and it allowed 96. So this was you know that grid that I showed you with combinatorial chemistry. There'd be eight uh, eight rows and 12 different columns, and each one of these vessels had, if you look real closely, a little tiny white frit, and that became the uh, the basics of having a reaction vessel where you could do solid phase organic chemistry, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. In each one of those vessels, unique molecules made in all 96 positions and steps of, of reaction, filtration, washing, new reaction, filtration, washing, carried out, uh, hopefully uneventfully, but you know there were some practical problems with this equipment, I'll say. At an extreme, um, we had bought at Lilly an, uh, a uh, pretty sophisticated, piece of equipment called the Trident from Argonaut. And it allowed us to program uh, all these steps of a synthesis. So we'd have a, a, a multiple step, maybe oh, 10 step synthesis uh, based on solid phase chemistry, but where the, the reagents would be added uh, automatically from vessels that would be stored up on top. The uh, uh, reaction uh, catalyst would be added. All these things would be stored up in this block, It'd be added through all sorts of tubes, sequentially to, in this case, a 48 block of reaction vessels. And the reactions would be done, they'd be washed and all that stuff. It was a great concept, but imagine what it was like when one of the tubes that was gonna bring down uh, a, a, a particular reagent uh, or uh, in a solvent got clogged because it, we didn't realize that that particular reagent or that particular catalyst would not be compatible with particular solvent at that particular step, the, the thing would get clogged and the whole thing would shut down. So it was a great idea, but it required a lot of intest, intensive babysitting. So we've evolved over the years, uh, we meaning the whole area of, of solid phase combinatorial chemists, to other simpler uh, ways of carrying out this reaction. And I just want to point out uh, a really elegant uh, solution to this from my good colleague, Victor Kirknak, who teaches both at Polotsky University in Olomouc in the Czech Republic, but also at Notre Dame in the United States. And he's developed this very simple system where he, he, he um, modified some regular syringes and stuck a white frit in the bottom. And that became the reaction vessel. And he could mount these, plug these into a network uh, uh, of uh, vessels and so this was, I guess, a four by six uh, block, which he calls a domino block. And he could then have the, the whole process, auto, not quite automated, automated, but really manually uh, operated by
by having some valves would emit various solvents and various starting materials to these, these things. The syringe would go up and down. It would uh, allow the, the reagents go, to come in in solution. Then they'd be expelled and go out the waste and then they do the washings. It did all this very simply. And Victor told me that uh, should there be interest at uh, Tereshevchenko or even Enemy in uh, exploring using some of this equipment, he'd be uh, happy to provide uh, the apparatus for free, uh, quite, quite generous to, to, to have that kind of tried out. So you might keep that in mind when, when you see some of the power of the combi chem that we might be able to do on solid phase. This is just uh, a further simplification, simplification of some equipment we used at Lilly. Uh, here again is the fundamental uh, reaction vessel, glass vessel with a white frit in it uh, and screw capped, very simple, and it's organized on a plate. It, it, this collects the washes. This, we put that on top of the vials that ultimately when we cleave the, the molecules from the resin uh, and now they drain into the vials and they're collected. That can be bought uh, for, I think, too much, uh, too uh, high a price from uh, chem glass. Uh, again, I'd be willing to supply some of this for free uh, because that's the whole idea uh, if there's interest. And frankly, you know, there's no reason this stuff can't be uh, 3D printed uh, except for the glass. And I bet uh, there's some really expert people in Ukraine who, who can make these simple vessels and, and supply them. So let's see this combinatorial solid phase chemistry in action. Uh, I'm going to again go to the primary examples of this at the very beginning of the combinatorial era. And that was, again, from peptide chemists because they had developed the chemistry and, and they were wanting to make lots and lots of peptides. So I'll give an example of making a tripeptide uh, using, making 8,000 tripeptides using solid phase uh, uh, chemistry. And the first step would be to attach the uh, starting uh, protected amino acid to a resin bead. Once that's done, you now have available, again, all the power of simple purifications that comes from solid phase. So in this case, imagine that you've taken all 20 different amino acids, and, and this is what they do, take, and, and in separate reactions, made 20 different batches of the resin beads with, this, with the 20 different amino acids attached to it. Now they take, a power, uh, uh, take advantage of the power of solid phase chemistry and all they do is chop off the Bach group with, uh, with in this case, uh, it, the resin was stable to TFA with trifluoroacetic acid. Now they, again, just you know, wash away trifluoroacetic acid, neutralize, and they're ready for the next step. The next step would, to be a, would be a combinatorial step where they take a second amino acid. Now I've just flipped this guy over, but it's a generic second amino acid with one of the 20 different amino acids side chains here, they couple it to the each individual batch of the R1. And now they have 20 times 20 different possible reaction vessels, 400 reaction vessels with 400 different compounds resin bound. They then uh, just remove the Bach group, uh, do the washings and the purifications. They're ready for the third combinatorial step where they take a third set of 20 different amino acids, same ones as here, and they now attach it to the uh, growing peptide. Now they have a tripeptide with any one of 20 different amino acids of R1, R2, and R3. They're ready now to cleave this from the resin. They take off the Bach group. In this case, they probably would have used HF if they were peptide chemists to cleave it from the resin. And they get this tripeptide, which is now represents 8,000 compounds. They would have had to had in, in the simplest way of doing this, or not the simplest, but the simplest conceptually, 8,000 different reaction vessels. There are all sorts of really clever ways of doing this in, in less than 8,000 reaction vessels. They're split and mixed. There are all sorts of different ways that people have of doing this, but I won't talk about it, but they can make these 8,000 compounds, and this has been done. Pioneers in that area were obviously Merrifield, but Geisen, he used some very interesting technology. Houghton with tea bags that would contain these resins, and Owens de Marchi, um, yeah, were developing these libraries of peptides. Well, 
this was in the very, very early days of combinatorial chemistry. And it was before the organic chemists got involved, the peptide chemists, you know, par excellence were the ones doing this. Um, so the organic chemists saw the potential and we had good high throughput screening of evolving to test the molecules that could be made. So it really pushed the area to get organic chemists to figure out ways to make very quickly large numbers of potential drug molecules. And one of the earliest representations of this, this, this wasn't the first, it was the second. The uh, first was really uh, Barry uh, Boonin and uh, uh, Elman, who had done this uh, about a year later, a uh, year earlier. But I love this synthesis, so I'll just point it out. Sheila Hobbs-Witt was one of the earliest pioneers in this organic manifestation. And what she did was, no surprise, starting out with a resin bound amino acid that organic chemists, you know, they were just getting, learning about this whole area and they, they were learning about the peptide chemists and they took advantage of peptide lore and, and uh, uh, expertise in using resin bound uh, amino acids in the case of peptide chemists to make peptides. But now a bunch of organic chemists started using these as starting materials to make organic molecules. So what uh, Sheila did with her coworkers she made eight different imine derivatives of this molecule where R2 was varied, R3 was varied, R4 was varied, and then did a transimination reaction to make this intermediate here. And this is a really cool thing that I, I like. I, I love the idea that instead of having to use an external reagent to cleave something to, from the resin, if you set up the chemistry properly, the final step involves making a new scaffold that also cleaves the molecule from the resin. So here's this molecule waiting. The nitrogen uh, with its unshared pair of electrons can come in, attack that ester, ester-like bond as so, and now generate an amide bond, but in the process to cleave the molecule from the resin. So I'm going to call these uh, final cleavage steps cyclative cleavage. So that's an alternative to using some kind of uh, reagent to cleave the bond between the resin and the molecule, if you can get the final scaffold made by a cleavage process, it will now generate your molecule, often quite pure, because the only cleavages that occur are the ones that occurred because all the preceding steps had worked successfully. So that had led, as uh, Sheila Hobbs DeWitt, uh, Boonin and Elman's work, led to a big growth of combinatorially based solid phase synthesis of organic molecules. This first series of simplest would, would be obviously things that weren't just peptide-like, but you could now isolate uh, the natural amino acids. This didn't have to be an amino acid. So that, that's a really simple library to make. Uh, of course, Boonin and Elman previously shown how they could use starting uh, amino acids on resin to make benzodiazepines. This is real close to the structure of, di of uh, Valium. Uh, other reports on benzodiazepine own diones. Uh, high dantoins were a very simple procedure to use. Uh, you could make diketopiperzines. Now you had three points of substitution. So you can imagine the size of potential combinatorial libraries that you could make from that. Well, uh, I got involved in this area, oh, in the early, late, uh, early 90s and was aware of this literature from uh, Elman and from uh, Sheila Hobbs DeWitt and from a lot of other folks that are beginning to use amino acids resin bound to make organic molecules. So what the insight that, that we had was my colleague, uh, Dr. O'Donnell had a really nice way in solution of converting glycine to unnatural amino acids. So he'd, he'd alkylate, well, a typical procedure would alkylate at this alpha carbon via an enemy an imine-based intermediate that activated that the proton removal on that carbon. And he could introduce uh, various groups to that position in solution. Well, I, I knew about uh, Dr. O'Donnell's uh, experience in literature and got in touch with him. And we worked together to adapt his chemistry to solid phase. And so now we could, on solid phase, make the imine derivative of glycine and uh, with uh, a series of very simple bases, extract that proton alkylate to make this molecule. Well, why were we interested in that? I think one of the wonderful things about CombiChem and the literature that's coming out is people have these very nice procedures 
but oftentimes if, if you can figure out some nice chemistry, you can develop ways to make one of their key starting materials and in much greater diversity and use their, this new starting material, but the same procedure that they had developed, you just plug it in with these new diverse molecules. <laughs> So here's our chemistry. Now, instead of just having simple amino acid side chains, we can have literally hundreds of different R1s to feed in to what was already known in the literature and make now many more isolated unnatural amino acids here, many more benzodiazepines in principle. These are the virtual libraries that we could make based on people's already published procedures, but plugging in now just not just 20 amino acids, but hundreds of different R1s. This is another example here. And then we developed our own chemistry to make some libraries, multiple points of substitutions there, multiple points of substitution there. So at that point, with a little bit of background on the evolution of solid-based chemistry from the peptide work to the early work in uh, organic chemistry, I'd like to give a really nice example of the thinking process really early on that uh, a player and his colleagues uh, did to make combinatorial libraries. And it illustrates a lot of the thinking that goes on and the good work that can go on to generate these libraries. So in general, if we're gonna uh, pursue this in drug discovery, we wanna pick some kind of good target structure based on our understanding what, what our ultimate molecule target is gonna be if it's a drug target or something that makes sense based on our, our understanding of what our, uh, I'll use a, a very uh, uninformative term, but drug-like molecules, molecules that people in all sorts of ways might have a judgment could be potential drugs. Uh, we'll design a combinatorial synthesis, analyze the virtual library that's created, can be created based on that combinatorial synthesis, rehearse the reagents and carry out the synthesis. So here's Podorf and coworkers in action. They looked at the literature and saw a, a series of molecules that were biologically active and recognized that they all had within them this core substituted hydroxyproline derivative, five-membered ring, carboxylic acid from proline, hydroxyproline here, but all of them had that core structure. And they said, well, we'll use that as a, a scaffold to build all sort, combinatorially all sorts of related molecules and, and explore them as potentially biologically mo active molecules. So here's the scaffold they identified quite simply. They were gonna substitute the, the hydroxyproline on the nitrogen, the carboxyl, the hydroxyproline on the, uh, uh, here with amines and make all sorts of phenol derivatives on the hydroxyproline portion. They designed this combinatorial synthetic pathway. Here it is, they start out with a resin bound, this is gonna be a linker ultimately, but they do a reductive amination, but put in the first variable. So there's one of three variables they're gonna have in the scaffold. They then stick on the scaffold by an, a simple amide coupling. With that on, then they take that molecule now, it's all resin bound chemistry. They take off the FMOC protecting group with base to generate the free amine. And then they do the final, well, sorry, the second combinatorial step. Now they treat this with all sorts of different aldehydes, do a reductive amination to put on that group. Now they're ready for the final third variable and they're going to do it at this site. So they take off a protecting group on that oxygen, generate a free hydroxyl group, and then do a Mitsunobo re reaction to simultaneously introduce the new group, but uh, invert the stereochemistry at that position that gives them their fully substituted target molecule. So they developed that synthetic route, showed that it worked on a few examples. And then they did a process that I think is now becoming pretty common in the area. They generate, enumerate is the word we use, but they generate a virtual library of all the possible molecules based on the synthetic scheme that they've shown and available reagents that they've identified. The enumeration process is, is where you take uh, your chosen synthetic scheme and you computationally construct all the possible molecules that you can make from available reagents. So you, there, there are many different programs to do this. We use earlier on Afrin, uh, where we use oftentimes now Chemaxon's reactor. Uh, I just recently was, became aware of a company called Optib Optibremium 
that has their own software. There are many software out there and they, they approach this from different uh, perspectives. I like uh, a program that Afrin had because it was reaction based and made a lot of sense to a synthetic organic chemist that you could just write out the individual steps. And if you build in some intelligence about what was, would work or wouldn't work in a particular reaction st step, you could just plug in reagents and it would automatically reject things that wouldn't work and, and use things that would work. Uh, but that's a, another story. Anyway, you can use these uh, software packages to take that reaction sequence, available reagents and construct a virtual library. That's what uh, Player and his colleagues did for the scaffold. They took 100 amines, 100 aldehydes, 100 phenols, all those that would be uh, used in this reactive sequence and generated uh, a virtual library based on that. They then computationally analyzed it. And they wanted to see, you know, we're not gonna make all million compounds, but which ones might make the best sense uh, to make from a variety of perspectives. So there are all sorts of uh, ways of processing uh, and analyzing these virtual libraries. Uh, they're descriptor-based programs uh, from simple to elaborate. There's rules that people propose to, to discern what molecules might be potential drugs, uh, might be absorbed, might be metabolized. The some set of those uh, um, pr uh, programs are one Lipinski came up with some rules to rule out molecules that wouldn't likely be drug molecules. There are three-dimensional docking programs, many other computational filters. They use the subset of these to come up from that 1 million compound library to a real library. I'd use that term real and realize that it's, it's relevant to enamine and chemspace because they have their own real library and which has a lot of value. value. Uh, Anyway, a real library of 128,000 compounds based on that analysis. And those, to make those 128,000 compounds, they would need 40 amines, 80 aldehydes, and 40 phenols. Now's the next step in, in, in converting a virtual concept into a real com, uh, concept, something that isn't always done when people publish a combinatorial library. And that is what reagents will actually work in that particular sequence. So they do something that's really valuable. They rehearse or they test all the reagents at each individual step uh, of the sequence to make sure that at least at that step, that reagent will work. So they took those 40 amines, 80 aldehydes and 40 phenols that they had just identified computationally that be interested in because they would make that virtual library that they were interested in. Uh, they went back and they took the synthesis and they looked at the first step and they rehearsed all 40 amines to see how effectively or how well they would do this reductive amination and found out that, well, I guess 25 of those amines didn't work. And they limited the 40 to 15 amines that would satisfactorily undergo reductive amination. Then they took that second step sequence where they and put in the second variable, they converted, took off the F mock and then tested this key step for introducing the aldehyde onto that amine by a reductive amination. Again, they, they checked out 80 aldehydes in this case and found 34 aldehydes at work. Finally, they looked at the, the Mitsunobu reaction to do that displacement. They looked at 40 phenols and had a reasonable success rate there of 20 phenols working at that particular step. So now they have 15 amines, they had 35 aldehydes and 20 phenols. Now that limits their library from that, uh, I believe it was 128,000 before they did the rehearsal to 10,200 compounds that now they realistically feel they can get when they synthesize because they've tested out the reagents at each one of these critical steps. So they do that, they've successfully rehearsed the amines, aldehydes and phenols. They uh, use those to create, create a 10,200 member library, which they actually made. <laughs> and they use a variety of sophisticated tools. Again, I won't talk about these there. Uh, they didn't have, uh, well, you know, in this case, actually, they had ultimately uh, 10,200 separate reaction vessels. They, they were these Aurora cans, but uh, they use them uh, with ways of tracking those little cans that contain the resin beads. Uh, again, subject for another discussion. 
And then they characterize all of them by LCMS and then 20 of the products uh, by uh, NMR. So uh, here we are, a, few, a nice example of how somebody might use a combinatorial process, solid phase synthesis, to uh, make a libraries around the particular scaffold. One of the problems that CombiChem had in the early days was the lack of sophistication in the molecules that were being made. This was driven by people just trying to take the simplest chemistry they had available and sticking things together without a lot of consideration for whether or not what they stuck together would be actually a potential biologically active molecule. Schreiber uh, suggested back in 2000 that we needed to increase the complexity of these libraries uh, by having synthetic routes that would generate molecules with a lot of uh, uh, structural complexity, three-dimensional structure uh, complexity, and he published that in Science. <clears throat> well, I, I agree that, that that'd be a valuable thing to do, and I'm just going to give you one uh, short example uh, of uh, how we've done that in our own work to make pretty complex molecules, uh, biomimetic molecules, from very simple starting materials. So back in, uh, I mentioned that we have ways of on resin, introducing unnatural amino acids. Well, we, we further developed that chemistry so that we could have R1 be all these different groups that we were unnatural amino acid side chains in addition to natural amino acid side chains. And we could do a second alkylation at that alpha carbon and put on an allyl group. That's really helpful. So with that allyl group, and I'm gonna just put an asterisk here to designate that carbon so you can track it through the synthesis. With that allo group on that molecule, we can now on resin do a ace, simple acylation re uh, reaction with all sorts of different carboxylic acids to put on our second variable. So we have R1 variable here, R2 variable there. And then we would ozonalize that olefin to generate an aldehyde. What we could do with that was pretty um, uh, complicated, but simple <laughs> at the same time. Uh, if we took that molecule and reduced the aldehyde to an alcohol, Remember, I love cyclative cleavages like uh, Sheila Hobbs DeWitt did in her early, really early work. So you reduce this to the alcohol and then the alcohol spontaneously does a lactonization and you get these lactones. Uh, those actually are uh, analogs of, of some really important quorum sensing molecules produced by bacteria. You could do a reductive amination on that aldehyde. So bring in all sorts of amines reduce it to make it amine, and then it snaps shut again. Now it forms a lactam rather than a lactone, and you get these conformationally restricted lactams with the three variables present. Or you could take cysteine. Cysteine and make it, the sulfur and the nitrogen will form a five-member ring here at that carbon, that aldehyde carbon. And again, the nitrogen would shut, sh clam, slam shut on that carbonyl and do a cyclic of cleavage to make this molecule. We can make these simple looking molecules, but in fact, R3 could be part of a peptide chain. So we could do fragment condensations where R3 was part of a peptide, terminated at the end terminus by a cysteine residue and snap shut that molecule into an organic molecule of this type of structure. Uh, we could also take another biologically re relevant scaffold, phenylethylamines, and that would attack the aldehyde form an aminium ion that would close on the uh, aromatic ring and then again snapshot cyclic cleavage. And we could make tetracycles that way with indole derivatives like such. And just to give you some examples of the real molecules that are made by that process. Here's an example where we started out with phenylalanine, one of the many amino acid naturally occurring ones we could use in this chemistry. We isolated uh, with the, just a simple uh, acyl group that became a key intermediate that we could take with phenylethanolamine, do the reductive amination, get this lactam, or we take it with cysteine, either peptide residues or other residues off of that, get these bicyclic structures uh, containing both a natural amino acid uh, at two positions, the phenylalanine and uh, the cysteine. Uh, or uh, this is uh, the methylated serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, but now methylated, and that will undergo pictic spangler reaction to make these complicated molecules, dopamine to make these. All these from just a simple, we can make a big batch of this 
and take it in all these directions in two steps with these reagents. So that's just uh, an example of diversity oriented synthesis that's possible these days using solid phase chemistry. Since 1992, there's been a ton of literature on solid phase chemistry, combinatorial chemistry to make all sorts of different molecules. So uh, I just point you to reviews that were going on until the combinatorial chemistry area lost some interest within the organic chemistry community. Uh, there was a, uh, a person, Roland Dole, who would publish each year in Jave Combi Chem his particular review of the literature. And so I'm just gonna show you in 2005, well, in 2006, he published a review of the literature in 2005. And this gives you an example. I don't expect you to, to look closely at all these, but just to impress you with the fact that these all represented various chemical libraries published in the literature of interesting molecules that were biologically relevant uh, with varying numbers made as uh, proof of principle in these libraries. And, and so that was published. And then there was also within that same review, he talked about a whole bunch of scaffolds that people come up with and the combinatorial chemistry that they developed to substitute those scaffolds uh, here in all these different ways. And that was kind of the at the height of the combi-chem world, which as I mentioned, you know, has fallen out of favor in a lot of ways because people didn't, I think, use it properly and take advantage of it properly. And so what I'd like to suggest as I'm in my final slides here, just a few slides is that, yes, CombiChem is a multifaceted strategy to integrate this theory, technology, synthesis, and testing. And that there have been many diverse virtual libraries made available from both uh, enumeration uh, uh, of these and that, that are based on solid phase combinatorial chemistry. Here's what was frustrating to me, and I think frustrating to a lot of us, is that there's a lot of this good chemistry out there, but it just was published and just sat there. And I don't know that many people would take up any one of those individual articles and use the procedures that have been developed to try to come up with drugs. And so I'd like to take the last few slides to focus on how one might turn that combinatorial chemistry potential into reality. And so uh, I believe that if we go back and look at a lot of these procedures or, or even our own procedures and ident identify those that have really good reproducible chemistry, as we all know, it's one thing to publish an article and have the specialized e expertise that enabled you to, to carry out the work that's published. It's another thing for somebody else to take that same procedure and read about it and take new reagents and get it to work. So we have to identify which of those are really good with reproducible chemistry. Then if we enumerate the virtual libraries based on those procedures, we can, if we make them available globally to all, all scientists uh, so that they can do the computational analysis and selection of molecules for synthesis. And if we have the ability to now take those selected molecules and make them and carry out the synthesis, we could have a really powerful process. And the thing that really catches me and really makes me excited about being able to be talking to you is that in Ukraine, we had some of the best expertise carrying out this kind of process already. An example, I believe, would be for the enemy and chem space model, where they provide their, their real database, really based on combi chem procedures. Most of their work, to my knowledge, is based on solution phase chemistry. But if you had solid phase chemistry procedures available, presumably they could do the same thing with those. And they've enumerated uh, libraries based on uh, uh, starting materials that they have sitting in files waiting for use. And those are available for computational analysis. And that's where people worldwide are today, you know, selecting molecules for their own work to be made and um, then carried out. And what I'm gonna do is just give you a few slides of uh, a preview of what I'm gonna talk about next Tuesday, because we're trying to carry out this model, not in a commercial way that enamine and chem space would, but on an educational model. So the idea we're, we're uh, working off of is, again, we'll, we'll develop some, we call this distributed drug discovery and, and D3 for short, but we developed some basic chemistry research, oftentimes revolving on literature 
research that's been done, but we modify it to make sure it's reproducible, can be carried out by organic chemists, even student chemists. We create these large virtual catalogs and uh, are looking either ourselves or to others to analyze them. But when we get the proposed potential drug leads, this is the cool part. We're gonna distribute and we do distribute the synthesis of individual molecules to various schools throughout the world so that they students can learn about synthesis. At the same time, they're making molecules that could be these potential drug leads. Uh, we also have a program where we're working with biologists to develop educational models that can uh, test these molecules for uh, as potential drugs and in that way distribute not just at IUPY but to other schools that ability to, to both make and test molecules. So we're pretty excited about that. We're excited because, uh, well, we're, we're involved in education, but we, we think that it's something that will give our students a concrete understanding that uh, their, their work, learning organic chemistry, is not something that's gonna be part of a laboratory where they make something and throw it in the waste disposal uh, canister at the end of the day, because it's already been made a thousand times. But instead, they make at least two molecules in each one of their hands, one of which will be a control molecule, which we know works, but the other will be one of these new molecules that have been selected from the virtual catalogs. And we do this uh, right now, we just started a lab on a 30 compound scale where our students are making 30 new compounds as part of their regular undergraduate second semester organic chemistry course. But we've carried it out, obviously at IUPY, this is where we, we have to first show that it works. But when we're confident it works, we take it to other laboratories throughout the world. So we've done a D3 combinatorial organic synthesis laboratories in Lublin, Poland. We've done it in Mexico City, and we've done it in University of Havana, along with, we've done it in uh, Barcelona, we've done it in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, various places in the United States. So that's kind of a preview based on this discussion I just presented of combinatorial solid phase chemistry of what we can do and a vision of how we can uh, help uh, people along the way to drug discovery with student involvement in education and, and making these molecules. So just uh, alert you, the future le uh, lecture, the last lecture will be next week and I'll talk more detail about this D3 project with specific uh, application to a, one project where we're developing uh, possible drug leads to, to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa and a, a lab that we're really excited about right now, it's going on right now uh, at IUPUI to make inhibitors of a key enzyme involved in uh, SARS-CoV-2 replication uh, to prevent uh, COVID or to treat COVID, uh, inhibit a key enzyme in that process. So I'll, I'll talk about that um, next Tuesday. So again, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I know it's, it's not uh, an easy world that we're living in today. And I hope that this will be, uh, uh, at least give you a sense that you can be involved in other ways besides things that are destructive um, in, in helping out people and getting educated. So thank you very much. Thank you, Will, for your very nice lecture. And uh, uh, it's very interesting how uh, the thinking on combinatorial chemistry was done in uh, various parts of the world. And I see that uh, it was very similar to what was happening at Inamin in the mm -hmm. 19th, because uh, uh, Professor Tomachov and the guys who started all of this, if they understood uh, very early the power of uh, these virtual libraries. So uh, he told once that uh, the first library was simply hydrazone uh, comb combinations of hydrazines and aldehydes, and they uh, prepared a, a large virtual library of, the, of these compounds, and then they were commercialized quite successfully. And then uh, more and more reactions were added to this approach. So this is indeed how this is indeed interesting how uh, in people in different places. And uh, they didn't uh, communicate with each other and uh, aim to, to the same, essentially the same model for mm -hmm. virtual libraries and library synthesis. And uh, are there any questions, perhaps? Yes, Anastasia, please. 
In which uh, case is better to use parallel or, um, or serial syntax? So you're you're asking which uh, approach is better, parallel synthesis or the combinatorial synthesis? Yes. Yes, I think it, it just depends on, on, on what your goals are. If um, the combinatorial synthesis has the power of making many molecules from a limited set of reagents, but if you have a really well-targeted library and, and you're making, say, a systematic a variation at just one position in that molecule, uh, I think parallel synthesis would be should be fine. You just make a big batch of the the one um, uh, of the molecule with the one site of substitution available and do that. So I can't say that there's that there's one is always better than the other. It just depends on the particular application. Good metro. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about the, um, uh, any problems connected with the combinatorial chemistry. So um, as far as I know, uh, we have some troubles, for example, with purification stage and uh, synthesis stage. For example, you showed that Mitsunobu reaction is quite successful in this approach, but uh, there are still some reactions that are not. And uh, how can we actually cope with this problem and not to avoid it? Uh -huh. Yeah, so I mean, the, the first approach is to re rehearse all the reagents to make sure they work at that particular step. But even that doesn't guarantee that when you're making a complicated molecule, that even though you rehearse that uh, particular reagent and know that, that say the Mitsunobu re reaction worked well with that at that particular uh, part of the molecule, when you make the, the actual library, there may be other parts of the molecule that you didn't uh, think about that could interfere with the actual Mitsunobu and, and, and those parts weren't represented in the trial rehearsal of that reagent. So that's one problem. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of these procedures produce uh, uh, molecules that aren't pure. And um, I think one of the real uh, problems in the combinatorial chemistry area is that we, we were testing libraries where maybe 80% of the, the, uh, the, the uh, mixture, uh, mixture was the actual compound that you wanted, or even less. And Unfortunately, people didn't, uh, the organic chemists didn't have the natural products expertise to recognize that even though something turned up positive in a screen that was impure, that that wasn't the time to go back and just make the molecule you intended to make. It was the time to go take that screen sample and do a biofractionation and identify what was the actual molecule in that mixture that was active. And it may not be the molecule you intended, it may have been an impurity but it's important and it can lead to a drug. So um, the, I guess the point I'm making is, yes, you're right. These things don't always work. Uh, and, and purification is a really important part of the process. But even if you don't purify everything to 99% purity, uh, it's important that if you screen them, that the follow-up work understands that there may be something else in that mixture that's active. And before you go synthesizing what you thought you made, that was should have been active you go and you do a simple you know chromatography and separate it into individual fractions and take each one of those fractions and resubmit it to the screen to see what's active and then and then characterize it thank you maria <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you very much for your lecture and uh, uh, I have a question about uh, solid phase uh, synthesis. Uh, so uh, about what amounts of uh, amino acids uh, we're talking about in uh, sweet peptide synthesis, like it's milligrams or uh, what is it? Yeah, if, if we're talking about uh, the work that we're doing, typically uh, in, a, in a given synthesis, we use, well, we use an excess of uh, the reagent of the amino acids if, if it's at a later stage in the synthesis. And so typically we use maybe a three equivalents of that. And so we'd be talking about for an individual reaction, maybe oh, 
uh, five milligrams. Mm -hmm. and, so not, uh, not... Yeah, and uh, in general, probably, you know, what is the uh, largest amount of uh, compounds we could uh, use in solid phase uh, huh. synthesis? Like, uh, could we make a scale up? Yeah, no, they can, they, they can, uh, this was another issue I know at Lilly for a while, they, they, the organic chemists, certainly the people in production thought, well, shoot, you know, this is a great thing to do things on a tiny scale, but you're never going to be able to scale it up. These things can be scaled up quite readily. And so, you know, 100 grams, uh, you know, just get a big 100 gram uh, vessel, but they, they scaled up. And even Lilly has done that, I think, through outside uh, uh, co contractors. They've scaled up the synthesis of, um, of, of proteins or peptides like Bieta, and there are a number of other good examples of solid phase chemistry scaled up at a production level. So that, that can be do, done. In our work, boy, the largest scale we would do something on would be maybe uh, 25 grams of resin. We might make 25 grams of resin as starting material for our undergraduates, uh, and then we distribute that to, we've got, uh, right now we've got six sections of students, 20 students each. So that's 120 separate students. And they're at least each doing at least two different reactions. So that's 240 different reactions that are going on right now in our laboratories. And so I think we scaled up, we probably had like 10 grams of starting material for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, if they uh, could be scaled up, I just uh, wondering about the steering of this uh, uh, ah. mixture. Do we need steering in the solid phase synthesis? Because uh, I never <laughs> carried it out. So this, you know, I wish I could give you an absolute, definitive, uh, authoritative answer on that. But the peptide chemist, when you saw that very simple vessel uh, with a stopcock on the end of it, they would have a simple. Uh, a, a, a thing that was an arm that would rotate back and forth and it twisted back and forth, back and forth. And that was how they, they did their the reaction. Your, these uh, beads are fragile. You can't just put them in a, a flask with a stirring bead to turn turning them because they'll start getting uh, uh, chewed up and, and made smaller and pretty soon they'll clog your, your uh, frit or they'll even start going through the frit. But, that, that the one thing that I think is interesting is it turns out if you have a, a high enough concentration of the reagents in your reaction vessel and you think about what the concentration of those reagents is inside the bead, if it's sufficient with the stoichiometry and the concentration to get the reaction to work, you don't even have to rotate the beads. And so what we do sometimes now is with our students, they add all the reagents, they might... Uh, Shake the shake it a little bit by hand, and for, and then then they'll put aside, and we'll wait for the next uh, lab section. So, I don't think it's the end of the story. I'd love to read what the literature says these days about how important it is to actually even shake beads. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Constantine. Much for your workshop. Just a few questions uh, from some simple. So one of the simple support is that uh, you told uh, that it could be three steps, for example, in parallel synthesis. And uh, what is the quill drop? So it's quite quite important. Uh, in peptide chemistry, on each step, if you have ninety and multiple on ninety and multiple on ninety. So uh, and uh, you told us that you work with so small amount like five milligram. So what could be our average real quilt in the solid phase uh, synthesis in pip for peptides in your uh, practice? Alexander, could you help, help me understand Constantine's question? <laughs> I believe he was asking about uh, uh, what is an average yield per step of something like that in combinatorial synthesis of solid phase because if uh, the yield drops in multi steps uh, synthesis right okay okay yeah uh boy the typical the power of uh solid phase chemistry and especially with the peptide work is that people would use the this excess reagent to drive each individual step to completion so oftentimes in our work 
even in organic chemistry, we do the same thing. We drive things to completion and our yields are, are quite good. I'd say, you know, maybe like even a student conducting a six step solid phase synthesis, starting with 50 micromoles of material, they might start out with effectively 15 oh, milligrams or so of starting material bound to the resin beads. And they'll get uh, maybe, uh, because the molecule grows a bit, they'll get maybe 15 milligrams of the crude material and then purified chrom chromatograph, maybe 12 milligrams. If you look at the actual yield, it would turn out to be an average yield of maybe 85% or so at each individual step or 90%. Okay, thank you. And another question, maybe it's too fantastic, but uh, idea comes from Inima screening when they do cocktails in the ampulla, they mix, for example, different compounds and uh, screen by Inima. So is it possible somehow apply this technique to do cocktail uh, in parallel synthesis? And the goal is to reduce the number of reactive vessels. So you someone told that huge number of reactive vessels and to right. do this, yeah. It's... Yeah, I, I think, you know, and I think uh, Professor Grigorenko does a, a nice job in his review article discussing some of these methodologies. So you don't have to use all those reaction vessels, but there's some very clever ways where people do uh, have mixtures of, of uh, beads in a given reaction vessel, each bead might have a different molecule growing on it. And they, so they don't do it in separate reaction vessels, but they have clever ways of combining and uh, dividing the reactions at individual sequences. And uh, I believe, you know, I can try to help you out on, on some of the references there, but I, I bet uh, Professor Grigorenko can give you some uh, references on the split and pool methods, uh, tea bag methods, a lot of really clever ways uh, of, of doing these syntheses. So you don't need 8,000 vessels to make 8,000 molecules. Thank you. So uh, if there are any, are there any more questions? So I don't see any. So I would like to thank uh, Bill for uh, his wonderful lecture again, and uh, also thank you for the discussion that we have. And uh, so see you next time, the next Tuesday. Very good. See you the next time. Bye. Bye-bye. Mm, Goodbye. Bye. Thank you for the lecture. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.